Okay, so now we can start and we're going to talk about deviated wellbores. Okay, so for deviated wellbores, uh, the procedure for computing wellbore stability is not too different from the one of vertical wellbores. The only thing that's going to change is how you calculate stresses around the wall of the wellbore. For the vertical wellbore, it was relatively easy because we assumed that one of the principal stresses, which is a vertical stress, coincides with the axis of the wellbore. And that allows you to get the Kirsch equations, which are relatively simple. Um, however, when your wellbore is deviated at a given azimuth and with a given deviation, uh, the equations for calculating stresses around the wall of the wellbore are not going to be that easy. Uh, in general, you're going to have a condition in which the axis or the direction of the three principal stresses may not coincide with the direction of the wellbore. And in that case, there are going to be some additional shear stresses that you have to take into account. And in order to make that uh, computation a little bit easier, uh, what we're going to do is, first of all, we're going to utilize the deviation and the azimuth of the wellbore to define a new coordinate system, which is a coordinate system of the wellbore. And after we do that, we're going to use stereo nets in which we will use surface plots that are going to tell us about, for example, PW shear or breakout angle or PV. The same things that you calculated just for one orientation with just a deviated wellbore. Now you're going to calculate it at any deviation. And that's why here we're going to use this stereo net because that's going to tell us in every possible direction what is the value that we need for wellbore stability. <coughs> So just as a um, reminder about stereo nets and deviated wellbores, what you're seeing here is a plot of a deviation survey. Every single point represents a point along the wellbore, and at every single point, for example here, this is the current azimuth and deviation of that wellbore. And there is one more thing here that we're going to add later on, which is a color legend that tells you in this example, for example, uh, what is depth. So, what do you see in this plot? Is the wellbore, does it start vertical or not? Let's forget about this point. Let's go directly in this region. It looks like after starting over there, as you go deeper from blue to yellow, the wellbore starts a little bit deviated, 10 degrees, not a lot, into the direction of 30 degrees from the north towards the east. And then as it gets into deeper uh, formations, uh, lower than 4,000 feet, it's more or less vertical, okay? And the same as depth, you could read uh, any uh, other quantity here uh, along the wellbore. So, uh, as a reminder, uh, what I'm going to show now on the process calculation is not something that you have to remember. Well, I mean, you have to remember that it's not something that you're gonna do for the homework, and it's not the equations that you have to memorize but you have to understand what's going on, how to get there, and how to read some of the plots, okay? So, everyone knows how to see a deviated wellbore in this stereo net map, right? Okay, then let's go with the, with the map. Uh, we already did this example, okay? So, I'm gonna skip it, and we already did that. Uh, thi this is another uh, example that you could check, no problem but this is what I wanted to get. First of all, the first step for calculating stability of deviated wellbore is to define a new coordinate system. As we always do, this is going to be a right-handed coordinate system 
where the first element is going to go from, you take a cross section of the wellbore, and then at the center of that cross section, the first element goes from the center towards the lowest point in that cross section. That's XV. Second element goes from the center of that, that cross section to a point which is in, in a horizontal plane. And that's YB. So YB is going to be always a line on a horizontal plane, no matter what is the orientation of the weld. And the third element is the one that goes in the direction of the wellbore, and that's ZB. You can check if this is a coordinate, right-handed coordinate system, right? So what we we'll do is X, this is Y, and B, and Z. So X, Y, and Z, it is a right-handed coordinate system. And as soon as you know the deviation and the azimuth of that wellbore, you can calculate this matrix that's going to allow you to calculate stresses in the coordinate system of the wellbore. So uh, you do something very similar to, to what we did for faults. You take the principal stress in the geographical coordinate system, SG. Uh, you put them in the wellbore coordinate system. And then uh, after you do that, you get the stresses in the coordinate system of the wellbore, and now this is going to be most times, if this is a deviated <coughs> wellbore, it's going to be a full matrix, not only with the elements in the diagonal, but also elements in the off di diagonal. And after you get that, you have to do one more step. Uh, you have to use those shear stresses, S12, S13, sigma12, sigma13, and also sigma 2, 3 to calculate the stresses around the wall of the wellbore. So these new equations combine what we already saw for Kirsch, and this is Kirsch with the principal stresses that coincide with the direction of the wellbore, and the addition of shear. You add those two, and now you have equations that allow you to calculate the radial stress on the wall of the wellbore the hoop stress on the wall of the wellbore, now there is a shear stress, tau c, on the, not exactly on the wall the, on the, on the, of the wellbore, but perpendicular to it, and also the stress in the axial direction. So now we, we may have principal stresses that do not coincide with the direction of the wellbore, but we, you are still able to calculate stress around the wellbore. But because there these two directions do not coincide, we, you're going to have some additional shear terms that you have to take into account. But it's very similar to what we did before. And the last step is to calculate principal stresses on the wall of the wellbore. And with those principal stresses, now you can use either a shear failure criterion for computing breakouts or a tensile failure criterion to see if you get to the breakdown pressure. But now uh, your Mohr circle is going to depend on your pr the principal stress on the wall of the wellbore and you're going to have this additional shear term. So uh, let me tell you what that additional shear term is. Before, we always had these stresses that coincided with the direction of the wellbore. So the maximum was in this direction, the hoop stress, and the radial stress was perpendicular to the wellbore. Now, because we have an additional shear term, the hoop stress may not be the a maximum principal stress, and it may be oriented a little bit at some angle, and that's at angle omega. And because you have that other angle omega, um, the shear failure and tensile failure is going to change a little bit in directions, but you can still use the same equations that we used before. So there are a few additional steps, but at the, at the end, you just have to do the same that, that we did before. Calculate stresses, use those stresses to see if they either hit the shear failure line or the tensile failure line, <coughs> and, 
and just check what is the pressure in the wellbore that takes you there. But it's exactly the same as what we did before, with a few more steps. So let's say that, that you do all that math, that you code all that math into a Python script or, or a model of a script, and uh, what do you next? Well, what you do is you either consider do this analysis for checking if there are breakouts or tensile fractures. Let's work with an example. Let me skip this one. This one is a little bit easier. Okay, so uh, let's read this statement. Uh, what kind of stress regime do we have in, in this example? Normal faulting, right? Why? Because the maximum stress is vertical and the minimum stress is horizontal. Okay, before we try to analyze what's going on here, uh, can you tell me for which wellboard? A vertical, a horizontal going direction of SH max or a horizontal going in the direction of SH mean, are you going to have the highest difference in stress? You remember that for analyzing wellbores, we do a cross section of the wellbore and we look at the stresses perpendicular to, to that direction. So I'm asking you for which wellbore, a vertical or a deviated going either in direction of SH mean or SH max, you have the maximum difference in stresses in the plane perpendicular to the wellbore. A wellbore going in the direction of SH max. You say that, uh, Mr. Uh, Ko. Why? And how much is that difference? Mm -hmm. SV minus SV. It's going to be 25 MPA, right? 70 minus 45. That gives you 25, and that's for a wellbore drilling direction of SH max. Okay, let me let, let's see. Uh, I hope that you know you can before. We're not going to do these calculations, but you have to to know how to read this. Okay, I have put the stresses here in this example. This is normal faulting, S1 is perpendicular to the paper, S2 is SH max, which is in this case is 67 at 70 degrees. Uh, so that's also a line that will go from here to there, right, 70 degrees. And S3 is the minimum principal stress. So a wellbore going in this direction, a horizontal wellbore, Perpendicular to it is going to have S1 and S3. And that's going to be the wellbore with the maximum difference of stress. Let's go to the stereo net plot. A wellbore that goes from here to there is a wellbore somewhere, somewhere over here. You see that? Or a wellbore going from here in that direction is a wellbore somewhere over there. And what this plot shows is what would be the required unconfined compression strength for a given wellbore pressure so you could avoid breakouts? And as you can see, for this wellbore, which is the one that has the highest stress anisotropy or the highest differential stress, you need a rock which is. Uh, needs to be much stronger than in any other deviation. So if you were to drill a wellbore in this direction or in that direction, with that mud pressure, you will have to have a rock that at least have 100 megapascal of unconfined compression strength. Let's go to the opposite. The opposite would be a wellbore that uh, has the least differential stress. And in that case, it will be a wellbore drill in the direction of SH mean. Why? Because the difference between SV and SH max is just 3 MPA. Well, 
according to this plot for a wellbore drill in this direction, <coughs> you're going to require an unconfined compression of the rock, strength of the rock, that is more or less the lowest for these wellbores, either here or there. So remember, these are horizontal wellbores. And in this case, the figure tells you that you will require uh, about um, 80 MPA of uncompi unconfined compression strength, so you do not have breakouts. For this particular case, the computation show that actually the lowest is not the horizontal, but it's a little bit uh, at a deviation of, say, uh, maybe 80 degrees or something like that. And uh, But you, you can see it's very close to the direction that we saw before and that we, we would have predicted without doing all these calculations. And in the middle case, you have a vertical wellbore that will require a, a rock that has a strength of about 90 MPA or UCS. So the objective of these uh, plots then is that we can see that at any direction, if the wellbore is stable or, or not. And and this is very important because sometimes you can go from vertical to horizontal and it's not the same if, if, if you go in this direction or in that direction. If you keep the same wellbore pressure or the same gradient, uh, your wellbore may become more stable sometimes if you go in one direction and less stable if you go in the other direction. Yes? Mr. Wheeler. The uh, 70 degrees means on there, like SH max equals 67. Yeah, 70 degrees is the direction of SH max. So in this case, it's going to be this is the north. So it's this angle over here. So. Any question about about this? No? Well, th there are a few more examples I have in the notes. Uh, there is one for, for strike, strike slip. And uh, what what deviation would you, would you expect in a in a strike slip regime would have a wellboard with the least stable um, configuration or mud window, which in which direction it will have the narrowest mud window in strike slip? In the vertical, right? And that's why this is all red in this area. This is a strike slip example. Whether you have the blue here or there, it depends. Depends on the on the other two stresses. But we know that in strike slip, the least stable is going to be vertical. In Normal faulting is going to be one in direction of SH max, and in one of reverse uh, faulting, the least stable is going to be a wellbore in the direction of uh, the maximum stress minus the vertical stress. So uh, it would be here in the direction of, uh, in this case, SH max. Right, because this is the maximum, that's the minimum. Okay. How do you do now this for tensile fractures? It's exactly the same, but now you change the criterion. Instead of using shear failure, you use uh, tensile failure, and you can get to calculate also what are the, the limits for BB and sometimes you know you get these funny images, uh, but it's because of the deviation of the wellbore. But it's very similar to what to what uh, we have seen uh, before. Any questions about deviated wellbores? I I I repeat what I expect is that, that you know how to read some of these plots, okay? And that if I give you something like that, that you can understand uh, what's uh, going on in there. And we could combine some of these plots 
we say a deviation survey like like this one and you could see how the mag window may vary uh, with uh, deviation and azimuth of the weather. All right, okay, so that's everything I want you to know about deviated weathers. Uh, if you actually want to code some of these equations, you're welcome to, and I'll, I'll be glad to help you, but that's not the required part of what we're going to see in this class. Okay, so last topic on wellboard stability. And I'm gonna do that on paper. Uh, let me come back over here. But you also have the notes. All right, so we what we wanna do is Let me put it on our page. You guys are very quiet today. Okay, so we're going to see other factors that affect uh, wellboard stability. The first one that we're going to see is temperature. We talked a little bit about temperature before. Uh, and uh, we're just going to repeat this uh, one more time uh, with, with some examples. You guys are all familiar with the phenomenon of thermal dilation, right? Thermal dilation is the phenomenon that if you increase the temperature of a solid or, or also a liquid, it will dilate. On the other hand, if you have a change of temperature, which is negative, a solid will shrink, right? And with rocks, it's the same. Uh, the parameter that tells you how much change of length uh, you have by a change of temperature is the thermal dilation coefficient and that tells you uh, you can reduce it to a linear relationship and it tells you what is the change of length by changing uh, temperature and usually you do this on a 1D experiment but you can take it to three dimensions it's, it's not, uh, it's not uh, too difficult to do that alright so you are all familiar with this but what you may not be familiar with it's a different case in which uh, you may have let's say the same rock and we're going to also reduce the temperature but what we're going to do now is we're going to glue that rock to the top and the bottom and that's going to be glued to walls that do not move at all. What do you think is going to happen now in this case? <coughs> Anyone who wants to provide it? Shrink on the sides. I agree with that. And what else? I hear tension. Why tension? It's trying to compress, but it can't because it's trying it's, to get smaller. It's trying to get smaller, it's trying to shrink, but it can't because it's prevented by these boundaries. So although it's going to shrink in one direction, in the other direction 
is going to develop a tension and that's what it's called this one was a thermal strain this one is going to be a thermal stress and it develops because it develops because you do not let the rock f move freely in the direction in which it wants and it's going to be exactly the same uh, in the wellbore in the wellbore if uh, now we take this to wellbore conditions we said that sometimes uh, the temperature is going to decrease in the wellbore because you may be drilling with a, a mud which is usually colder than what you have on the subsurface imagine if you go to work uh, to the back end shale in the, in the Dakotas then it's going to be pretty cold over there especially in the winter right and uh, even at night I don't know if you guys have gone to Yosemite uh, not, not Yosemite um, Yellowstone it's even freezing temperatures in the summer uh, in the morning so um, or if you were to, to go to Canada uh, your drilling mud probably is going to be much cooler than your formation and if you lower the temperature of the rock the rock will tend to shrink it might shrink in radial direction but it won't shrink on the radial direction actually if, if you think you know the movement of going from here to there you increase the radius but if you increase the radius you also increase the diameter right and if you increase the diameter you're going to increase you're going to add a hoop strain that eventually because everything is going to try to do the same is going to end up on a tensile stress and this is the tensile stress that we said before sometimes we you need to add to uh, wellbore stability especially when uh, you are computing the breakdown pressure and this additional hoop stress uh, is going to be proportional to that thermal dilation coefficient proportional to the change of temperature sometimes these changes of temperature can be huge uh, <coughs> as high as 100 degree F so do, do not underestimate uh, the, these changes of temperature and proportional to the Yam modulus divided 1 minus the Poisson ratio so uh, you can use or you can see where this uh, solution comes from but it's just a solution of uh, something that we call thermal elasticity that solving three dimensions allows you to combine thermal strain and stresses with changes of temperature and I think before we refer to this one as let me check but I think is we refer to this one as Sigma Delta T but it's it's exactly the same thing um, yeah uh, this is one that I meant Sigma Delta T uh, if you know the properties of your formation if you know the change of temperature uh, you can include that into the calculation of the breakdown pressure so question why would you include this thermal stress in the breakdown pressure and not in the shear uh, equation for calculating breakdowns uh, breakouts yeah but It's, it's, it's a real change of stress that you're going to have around the world board. so why to include it for tensile fractures but not for shear the, the answer is a just because it's um, 
it's not conservative to ignore it in this case because in this case it's going to really lower your value of PV but you could ignore it for shear because that's going to be a more conservative assumption you could include it in shear too but uh, it will be m more conservative to not include it but if you want you, you can all right um, so this one goes into the PV equation <laughs> Something I forgot to say from the first class that I wanted to, to say is that although we're putting emphasis on drilling stability, uh, on wellbore stability during drilling for wellbores, remember that wellbores are going to be there for sometimes for completion, if you do an open hole completion, and sometimes also for production, if you have an open case uh, uh, wellbore. So all these wellbore stability problems are going to apply uh, not only for drilling, but also for completion and production. And in this case, for example, uh, I just remembered that uh, the issue of temperature, because sometimes if you lower the temperature, you can lower PV. <coughs> if you lower the temperature, you can also lower the fracturing pressure. So you could also uh, lower the pressure required to do hydraulic fracturing by injecting cold fluids. There are some people that have tried to do hydraulic fracturing with uh, liquid nitrogen. Why? Because of the temperature effect. Lowering the temperature uh, helps the rock to shrink and helps that pressure to go down. And the lowest in temperature you go, the more of an effect uh, you get. <coughs> Okay, temperature done, and uh, let's talk about the second one, which is shale instability. Probably you remember from petrophysics that dealing with sandstone was much, much easier than de dealing with shales. Uh, shales have uh, clays inside the the shale and that makes rocks a lot more complex one of the phenomenon that you have in clays is that they are so small that sometimes there may not be a contact directly from clay to clay as you will have in two uh, grains of sand right for example if I if I had sand I know that stresses are going to transfer from grain to, to grain directly. But if you have clays, uh, they are so, so small that in a tiny space <coughs> like this, clays are going to look more like uh, plates you could imagine this as a uh, as a card and those plates are usually dependent on the pH of the water are negatively charged and that electrostatic charge makes a lot of difference because it attracts uh, ions with an opposite polarity right so if these are negatively charged probably you will attract more uh, positive ions but in if you have ions that means that you have water too right what is the chemical formula water h2o right and if this is a molecule of h2o that looks like a mickey mouse head what are going to be the ears of the the Mickey Mouse head? They're going to be hydrogen, right? So I'm going to write an H inside here, and this is going to be an, an oxygen. Which one is the positive? Uh, hydrogen is positively charged with one charge, 
and oxygen has two negative charges, right? So if you have these clay particles and water inside here, these water molecules will tend to orient uh, with the hydrogen closer to the surface and uh, well, this too big. So let me do it again. And if you have a typical salt like sodium chloride, which one is going to get closer to the clay? Sodium. The sodium, right? So sodium is going to be here where this is sodium and chloride is going to to be also round but not too close to the <coughs> to the layers well you put all of these together and in order to have electrostatic, electrostatic equilibrium this is going to get to a characteristic distance d in which that distance d between two platelets it's inversionally proportional to the ionic strength of the of the pore fluid why because when you have more ions the ions uh, ne neutralize the charging the plates uh, more quickly and so this distance becomes smaller but when you, you just have a few ions they form like a cloud that requires a larger amount of ions to have the same uh, charge than the platelets <coughs> so this is what you end up with distance d is inversionally proportional to the ionic strength so if you had a shale made out of clays and if you change the ionic strain you're going to change this distance in between the particles and you can also add a strain in the rock by changing the ionic strain of the fluid so let's imagine that uh, we are drilling a shale and we're using fresh water or or let's say uh, a mud with a very low salinity and that some of the drilling uh, water gets into the shale what's going to happen to the salinity in this region will it and shales usually have a high salinity and the drilling mud usually has uh, unless you modify it. there will be no reason to throw salts in the drilling mud unless you need it right uh, so let's say it has a low salinity if your fresh water invades the shale, it's going to change the salinity in the rock <coughs> and the ionic strength is going to decrease and if you go from here, let's say, into there, D is going to increase and what you're going to have is swelling of the shale. Um, why this is problematic? It is problematic because if you have swelling around the wellbore, what do you think is going to happen with the hoop strain? Remember what we said for temperature. <coughs> for temperature, we said that we have shrinkage and we favor tensile stresses and we favor lower breakdown pressure. What do you think is it's going to happen if we have significant swelling. What would you expect to happen around the wellbore? <coughs> Let's say we have a stable wellbore. 
everything is okay. You calculated PB, PWC are no breakouts, everything perfect. But now the water starts getting into the pores, start, starts lowering the salinity of the water and the rock starts swelling by this chemical action. So we, we have one option left, right? One was tensile failure, the other one is, you will have shear. You may have breakouts now around the, the wellbore uh, because uh, this crosses them in shear, okay? Now you may have shear because your hoop stress, now the rock is swelling, it doesn't have, it can swell in this direction, okay? But it cannot swell much on the hoop direction and the tan tangential direction, and so it's going to develop a lot of stress and it's going to fail in shear. And not only that, but sometimes it's not only that the rock swells, but in addition to swelling, it also gets weaker. Uh, here you see an example of uh, a dry shale that after you expose it to fresh water, it it really, you know, gets into crumbles. Uh, it just becomes um, like a mop. And uh, it's not only that, again, I say that the rock is swelling, but also that the rock now is getting uh, weaker. And weaker rock, that would mean more breakouts. And that would mean that uh, you're going to get into shear failure around the rock. So how do you do to prevent this type of water freshening and shale instability uh, due to uh, this chemical action of the water on the shale? What do you think? Well, How would you prevent this? Yes? All well base map. All base map. Uh, you went into uh, a good solution. And why oil? Because shells are not sensitive to oil. But why? How would you explain that based on what we discussed over here? Do oils uh, have any ions? Can can oil strip ions out of the of water? No, because it cannot partition the ions, and it, so it's not going to get the ions. And a null-based mud will actually uh, effectively it's not going to change the salinity of the rock. Uh, because it cannot stri strip the ions away from the from the pore water, so uh, that's that's one of the solutions. Uh, actually, that was a solution that came out from from a researcher from this department, uh, Professor Schenever, that already retired, but sometimes he stops by, say hello. Uh, what else? What else you 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 can do? Uh, you could use high salinity brine, right? So you say, uh, well, the salinity of my shell is too high. Well, I'm going to have a salinity in my mud, which is even higher. Uh, you could do that. And sometimes uh, a, a good salt to add is uh, potassium iodide, Ki. Uh, that's a very strong salt that uh, helps uh, to prevent uh, this type of uh, phenomenon. And there is one more solution that we said, we discussed in class. You remember which one? So you can tackle the problem. Underbalance. underbalance drilling, right? And how, why underbalance drilling would be good? You won't invade. You won't invade, right? If you do underbalance drilling, there is no filtrate. 
no filtrate water. And if there is no filtrate water, then there's not going to be change of salinity in the rock. Probably you get just a little bit uh, very near the rock by diffusion, but all, all advection processes will actually, instead of getting filtrate water into the shale, uh, you will get high salinity water from the shale uh, into the well. Uh, okay. Um, any question about about this phenomenon? It's very important. In some location, it, it's super important, and uh, especially when your your shales are not very uh, very strong. And uh, in some places, the only solution is to use all base mud. Well, if not, let's go to the third one, and probably we'll leave the fourth one for Wednesday. And the third one is loss of mud support. What do I mean with this? We said that the only reason by which we could say that the effective stress in the radial direction <coughs> is equal to the pressure in the wellbore minus the pore pressure is that we have an excellent or a very good filter cake or mud cake. That was the reason for assuming that. Uh, I'm going to remind you what I meant with this. I meant that if you have a rock which has pores and and you're drilling with the mud with particles, these particles I have a grain size distribution and that are specifically designed for obtaining a mud cake these particles are going to hold the pressure between this side and that side so that if you were to measure the pressure from here to there you will see something like this. The problem is that sometimes that mud cake, uh, although it may be effective at the beginning, uh, some of these particles may start moving inside the the medium, and it will it will not act anymore as a good mud cake but it's going to get diffused and if you lose some of the of those particles either because they fall into the well bore or because they get further inside into the rock now that low permeability layer is not going to be the that effective as it was before and now your gradient of pressure is going to be much smaller and although you thought that you had this at the beginning now you have much less and just one more say guys and the effect of that is going to be that as a function of time uh, you may have less and less readily stress support and your wellbore may fail after uh, a given amount of time because you lose your filter cake. All right, guys, uh, that's it. I'll see you on Wednesday. Uh, remember that uh, I uploaded the PDF notes. I uploaded practice exams. So start working on that. If you have any questions, I'll answer that on Wednesday. Yeah. Yeah, that's correct. Wednesday or tomorrow? What says in Canvas there? I think tomorrow. Yeah, but it's the same as what you have done before, okay? It's, it's not, there's nothing new in there.